Good evening, everyone. This evening, we will be in conversation with artists from our newly published book, This Quarantine Life, a COVID-19 era comics anthology. Uh, I'm Andrew Drillon, and I'm with the Art Students League of New York. And I was also the managing editor of this anthology. Thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate the launch of this book and to meet the artists behind the stories in it. Our program this evening will begin shortly with Stephen Walker, one of the co-editors of this book, and artist Jamal Eigel. Afterwards, we will have five artists from around the world joining us for a group discussion. Finally, we will have a short Q&A with our artists, so make sure to post your questions in the comment section below. Now, on with the show. Stephen Walker is the co-editor of This Quarantine Life. Mr. Walker has published graphic novels with Image Comics, Tor Books, and Random House. He's a founding member of Dr. Sketchy's Anti-Art School and is a beloved instructor at the Art Students League of New York, where he teaches comics and sequential art. A recipient of the 2011 Inkpot Award for Outstanding Achievement in Comic Art, Jamal Eigel is the writer, artist, and creator of Molly Danger for Action Lab Entertainment. He's the co-creator of Venture with Dynamo 5 creator-writer Jay Farber and the artist of the series Black for Black Mask Studios. Jamal is a 27-year, is this correct? Maybe longer. Um, He's a, a comic industry veteran and a former instructor at the Art Students League of New York, where he also taught comics and sequential art. Welcome, Jamal. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank you for Thank having, you for having us. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to have you both here since you both have experience um, you know, as instructors. But I'd like to start off um, mm -hmm. and talk about the league a bit. Uh, the Art Students League when we think about it, we often think of traditional media, drawing, painting, printmaking, sculpture. And so it's really exciting for me, uh, as someone who's passionate about comics, that sequential art is you know, now recognized as an art form at that institution. Jamal, you were the first comics and sequential arts instructor at the Art Students League. Could you tell us a little bit about how that came about? Um, yeah, well, the way it came about, uh, I was approached by the league. I attended the league when I was in high school back in uh, 1989, 1990. And I took uh, anatomy and I took life drawing classes at the league. So they were looking for someone who was league alumni, who was familiar with the school and how the school functioned, and somebody with uh, comic book credentials, somebody who could put together a class and teach a class. So we started um, the class, it, it grew fairly quickly in a very short amount of time. But um, I, I think I was there like two, almost three years. And then Steve came on board originally as my assistant and then took over the class and it's been running in his capable hands ever since. Wow. <laughs> um, that's amazing. And, and Steve, you know, yeah. what makes it so exciting to teach the comics class at the league? Uh, what, 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 makes it what makes it exciting to teach something that is so inherently narrative compared to other things that are taught at the league? Uh, you know, it's, it, it mixes so many different disciplines. Comics is kind of the, the the melting pot of of art forms in a lot of ways because you have illustration writing graphic design uh sto sh straight narrative storytelling all thrown into the mix all at once you have to be an incredible draftsman you have to understand lighting composition how to tell a story visually all of these things all together and that always makes it fun because you never know what you're going to to see from any students you know what's what's going to come out so that is what makes teaching uh comics at the league such an interesting and engaging and fun exercise on a, a weekly basis um and um 
um, Jamal, I'd, I'd like to ask you, actually, mm-hmm. you know, when you started teaching comics at the league, um, I don't know if you had a template in mind, um, kind of as an educator, um, for approaching this subject and introducing it to, to students. Um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about your approach and in, in how you presented such a huge topic um, to, to students? Well, it was a little bit of a challenge, and I'm, I know... Steve will agree with me on this point because of the way that the league classes are structured. You have people coming in and out every single month sometimes. So my focus was always to stick with the the fundamentals of uh, sequential art, starting with the very basics of how to build a page and then string together a structural narrative. But I think what made our class unique in a lot of ways was we weren't just teaching comics. We began each class with a life drawing component. We would spend the first half of the class doing life drawing and then the second half of the class would concentrate on comics. I felt that, and I, and I, and I say this uh, even now, years later, when I'm talking to young people who are interested in getting into comics, is I always felt like, and this was something that was impressed upon me as a student, that you need to know the fundamentals of drawing before you really get into doing comics seriously. And it doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, you have to have perfect anatomy or, you know, a perfect structure, but you have to have a, a structure that is your own. There has to be a symmetry in everything that you do. And I feel drawing from life enhances everyone's ability to translate what they see in their heads down onto the page. Ultimately, comics in general is very similar to poetry because it is a i think a more personal art form in a lot of ways a lot of times especially when i know when i'm writing stories i'm i tend to approach stories from a very personal angle even when i'm doing superhero work there's always a very personal bent i'm always pulling something from my experience my life experience, the places that I've been, the people that I've talked to, the experiences that I have, they all inform the things that I'm doing, whether it's for myself or commercially for other people. So I've always felt that that structure was important. And I feel and I, I hope that the, the students that I taught at the league benefited from that experience as well benefited from that that style of instruction um i don't think i'd ever seen a comics class run that way before and before the league and i think that you know having the the resources of the league as well was very helpful amazing and um speaking as someone who has been a student of stephen walker's class for the last five years um, I will say that he has carried on that um, that structure. So we do start off the class with that life drawing session. And it's it's huge. It's like half the day, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we move on to the more narrative aspect later on. So that fundamental which you've set up, um, that structure still carries forward. Um, Steve, how many years have you been teaching the comics class at this point? We started the comics class back in 2008, 2009, something mm-hmm. like that. No, it was earlier than that. It was, it was earlier before, than that. It was yeah. 2006 because that was before Katie was born. So so it's been going for, for what is that? That's 14 years now. 14 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so... Um, you know, and, and just as this is one of the things that, that as a teacher I love is, is that I learn just as much from the students as, as they've learned from me. That's, that's one of the biggest takeaways that I've had as, as an instructor is that as my students teach me more every day than I ever learned, you know, than, I, than I've learned on my own. And that's, that's a testament to you guys for sure. 
Well, well, to to jump on to that, actually, you know, Jamal talked about the fundamentals of life drawing and, um, you know, basic artistic skills that you need to carry into comics. Uh, but Steve, um, yeah. you know, since I started uh, in your class, um, you've really pushed uh, the 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 end point of comics as well by making sure that, you know, you create a culture of the class where people know that they're going to get published. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about publishing and how it plays a role in your class? Well, uh, publishing is always the, the end goal for any comics work. You know, you, you make a painting, you make a sculpture, the end goal is that finished canvas or it's that finished that finish sculpture, whatever it may be. For comics, the end goal is not that final page, that beautiful piece of art that you've produced. It's the the actual physical book that you're making. That's your, that's your final, that's your finished prize. And there's nothing better than being able to hold your own book in your hands. Something that you made, that you put out there and that you have put into the world and you can share with other people. There is no other feeling like it. And to not have an aspect of that in the class would be doing everybody in the class a disservice. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that that became a part of the process as well. And so for the past couple of years, I've been publishing a class anthology where we, we collect stories that we've all done and we put the whole package together and we publish it. You know, I publish it for the class for them and that led us inexorably to doing this anthology with the league proper. So it was kind of, it's kind of been a fun progression for that. Yeah, Steve, it, it was your, it was actually your experience um, creating those anthologies in the past uh, for your class that kind of fed into the idea of creating this book this year. Um, I mean, we at the league had done a, I mean, it was the middle of the pandemic, you know, and everyone was in quarantine. And we at the League had just done this successful open call to artists on Instagram with these daily prompts, like drawing prompts, kind of like in Tober. Um, and so, you know, the response to that was so immediate and enthusiastic that we believed that we could kind of channel that creative energy into a full-blown book. Um, and really, to our delight, we received submissions from artists in quarantine all over the world. Um, so we'll be talking to those artists shortly. Um, but thank you so much uh, for your time, Steve and Jamal. Um, we really appreciate you coming on tonight to talk a little bit about the class and the book. Um, and yeah, be well. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, I was just talking about how the book came to be and um, how it started off as a um, kind of an idea that was provoked by Stephen Walker. And when we put out the open call on Instagram, um, we were so amazed to have submissions from all over the world. Um, the book, This Quarantine Life, a COVID-19 era comics anthology, contains stories um, from 75 artists, over half of whom are new to the Art Students League. So tonight, um, we are so happy and proud to have these five artists join us. Uh, I'd like to welcome them now. From New Zealand, Martin Paris. Kia ora, talofa. Happy lunchtime from New Zealand. Thanks to Andrew and everyone at the Art Students League of New York for having me. <laughs> Uh, hi, Martin. Uh, from, hey. the, <laughs> um, from Czech Republic, uh, uh, Zuzana Matisova. Hello, hello. Thank you for having us. Hey, Zuzana. Thank you for coming over and joining us on this. Um, from Ecuador, we have Willie Orellana. Hola a todos. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hey, Willie. Hi. <laughs> welcome, hello. welcome. And joining us from the USA, from California, we have Michelle Din. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, Michelle. And last but not least, um, from Queens, New York City, we have Sophia Bahamon. Hello, uh, good evening from New York. <laughs> hey, Sophia. <laughs> 
thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to start um, start out with our international guests. So, uh, Martin, Willie, Zuzana, um, what moment sticks out in your memory when you realized this pandemic um, was something very real and serious? Because, you know, I'll start off with a flashback. For me, uh, it was mid-March in New York City, and we were already getting all these reports of how the coronavirus was spreading. A lot of people were getting infected, um, and there was a lot of uncertainty in the air. But personally, you know, I'm, I've always been a very optimistic person. Um, I... I kind of had this trust and faith that, you know, the scientists and doctors would figure it out before, you know, things would get so too scary. Um, and so I was just going about my routine, you know, going to the Art Students League, taking classes and um, working there, um, you know, like normal. But I went into school one day and went into work and I was told that we had to draft an announcement that we were shutting down the school. And, you know, when I was just, you know, I was working on that and like putting together the words, talking about, you know, what's going on, why we're making this decision. And that's when it really hit me um, that, oh my God, this is like, this is like a serious thing. And, you know, the irony of ironies after the school shut down, after everyone, you know, was sent home to quarantine, New York City itself, like two days later, made the decision to shut down. So it was like the league just sort of like uh, was the start and um, everything just kind of started rolling from there, quarantine for everyone. But yeah, um, Martin, you're in New Zealand. Yes. What was that moment for you? Uh, so I think speaking on behalf of New Zealanders, if I can, we, we, we followed the rules. You know, we, we did what we were told. Um, as soon as people started dying and, it's, and we saw what was happening overseas, I think we acted quick and we acted quite hard. Um, but that wasn't real for me. It didn't feel real for me. You know, you, you, as you said, Andrew, it's like the doctors will take care of it. A vaccine will happen or something. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it won't get out of hand. And it did. Um, so for me, it was when we had an announcement, our prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, came on screen and to the whole country just said, look, we're going into lockdown, full blown, everyone stay inside, everything's shut. Um, yeah, I think that was the moment. It's like, oh, this is, this is happening. Oh, that was crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Zuzana, um, for you, what was that like in the Czech Republic? Oh, yeah. Um, it was back in March as well. Uh, and I think uh, in our Republic, it wasn't spreading really fast, but we uh, heard a lot of bad news from Italy and Spain. So people started to be quite nervous, but it was quite similar as uh, in your case. I was in school and in the middle of lesson, we were told that our school is going to be closed and everything is canceled and that we should go home. And then it was really fast, uh, everything, all, all stores were closed and our cultural events were canceled. And I think the main moment when we realized it's much worse than we expected was when uh, people had to start to wear masks outside, but there wasn't enough face masks in stores. So they had to start to make it themselves. And I think this was the moment, yeah. Well, you're still in high school, right? Yeah. So did they manage to did they manage to continue um, after the lockdown um, in in some online form? Yeah, yeah, we have online classes right now. Oh, cool! Just like the Art Students League. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Willie, um, so you're in you're in Ecuador. You're in Quito, Ecuador, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. What was what was that moment for you? Well. Here at Ecuador, we had the sensation that this coronavirus thing was something that was happening very, very far away in the beginning. So it came almost as a surprise that at some point someone entered the country and had the virus. So it was like everyone started to, to speak very, very loud that, oh, oh, something is going on, something is going on. And we had a, a peaceful feeling at that moment. But then one Friday 13, I think it was, yeah, it was that day. People at work said that, okay, so Monday we're not coming and the government is thinking that 
maybe in about two weeks we're gonna come back again so I thought that uh, no there's not gonna be two weeks so my my thought was oh I want to enjoy civilization as I know it right now for the last time so I remember that I, I dropped home and on my way home I just went for a burger and I was eating and thinking this is the end of the things in the way I knew, knew it so that was for me it was like a moment in where I just was contemplating the last bit of what uh, I I knew that was oh it's crazy yeah, yeah. well um Michelle Din is joining us from California and um uh, Michelle thank you for being here um uh, just to set some context, I guess, um, in the U.S., uh, in the spring and the summer, um, while the government was dealing with COVID-19, there was this really loud outcry of racial injustice. And much of it was very focused on George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But even before that, initially, when like all of this started going down, there were many reports of anti-Asian sentiments in the country related to the coronavirus. Um, I'm going to be putting up your um, story on the screen for, for people to see. Give me a second. Um, but can you tell me, um, Michelle, like what experiences made you want to create this story um, for the anthology? So for the piece that I made, so as a disclaimer, I made this like very early on before, you know, George Floyd's passing. Um, so of course there's a lot of like reasons why, but the, there were actually the main two that like, you know, propelled me to actually make this piece. So I think with all the anti-Asian sentiment, like sentiments, the thing that bothered me was like seeing, um, also I think to put more context, like I live in California. So it, I live in an area which is like very like diverse, like, there's Koreatown, Little Tokyo, Cambodia Town, Chinatown. And to see like different Asians have like anti sentiments towards Chinese was very upsetting just because, you know, we are Asians, but they were just, I, I mean, like they were just like trying to like you know, alienate themselves from being like, you know, seen as a problem. And I know that's something I didn't like just because like we are a community and we should, you know, we, we protect everybody, like all races. And then the last one that actually was like the tipping point is, so for me, like I come from, I come from a family of like healthcare workers. My brother is a doctor, my mom's a nurse. Mm -hmm. My sister is a respiratory therapist and my friends, you know, they're, they're like studying become nurses. And for them to hear their experiences of like them literally working in front line and for patients to de deny being treated by them was kind of like a tipping point because it's, it's not right, you know, like, it's not right. And I was just like, at first, I didn't want to make this piece just because, you know, I thought it'd be a little bit too, you know, controversial, but I was like, you know what, like, like, of course, everyone's going through different things, but whatever, whoever anyone's feeling, you know, like they, whatever you're feeling, it has like value, there's validation. And I wanted to like, let other people know, like, you're not alone how you feel like, yes, yeah, like what's, we know what's happening is not as, you know, severe as everything else. It still has like meaning. So that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm looking at your story right now. This is, um, hopefully people can see this. Um, and it's, it's, you know, for something that's just one page, it's, it's covering a lot of, um, a lot of ground, a lot of themes, a lot of heavy emotions. Um, and I was actually wondering if, if you worked in, um, in the medical industry or, or something because of this, this section here. Um, um, but now that you've told me about your family, I guess that, I guess that makes sense. Um, I guess, um, how did you go about condensing all of that into this, this, this single page? Was it a challenge for you? No, um, like... It, so when I, when I made this piece, it was just kind of like, like during the day, I had like frustration to hear like my mom you know, get, getting a hard time, you know, from like racist patients. Mm -hmm. It was just me like just venting out my frustrations, like, you know, and this is not like, this reflects not just my experience, but like other experience I hear from other Asian, like Asian people in my life. Like there's, you know, like some of my, my friends who are dealing with, you know, the older generation 
who are not who are not understanding like you know what you're saying is you know, offensive about Chinese even though like you're not Chinese that is offensive and then and other people who are dealing with like you know they, they get racist remarks and for for us to have like a public figure um, who is just very you know misinformed and does not respect science and like the me like you know, medicine was very disheartening you know and it was just kind of like a like a I, I viewed it like I attempted this with like um with a view of I'm going to just draw like all my feelings as if it was a diary page and so that was pretty much it oh lovely thank you so much um so now I'm, I'd like to actually turn um turn it over to our potentially our youngest artist I think um <laughs> uh Sophia you're you're a local artist um you know, you live here in New York City. Now that you've heard the different experiences um, from your fellow artists, ranging from, you know, New Zealand, Czech Republic, Ecuador, California, um, how does this compare to what you experience personally here in New York? Well, I think a lot of what happened in New York, um, it was, see, the thing is, is that I think everyone in the United States was made aware of how much of an epidemic and of epicenter that New York was, um, mostly because we were one of the ways that it got into the United States and therefore um, spread much faster from here on out. And I, it's, it felt like from seeing all these experiences kind of felt like a passerby because once people started like under, like realizing that this is a thing that we need to fix, this is a thing that we need to be aware of, especially New Yorkers, around the same time that uh, cases started to go down around that sort of time, like in the summer, mm -hmm. when people start, are already aware that we need to stay indoors, we need to take in jobs and uh, take in internships online and virtual and stay as, you know, stay outside as little as possible. There were other parts of the country that was already rising in cases. So it kind of felt like uh, I was a passenger in, an all, like, in that sort of way. But from hearing all these experiences outside of the U.S., it's a little bittersweet. And I'll say why, because it's, you never want this, I, you know, it would, in comparison, it would be, you know, it would be bad if it was an epidemic, you know, just in the U.S. But knowing that it's a pandemic, that it's everywhere, it's, it's not great because you, you see all these people that are saying these experiences, you're saying, you're seeing all these people that, um, that are suffering because of it. But in, in a sense, and it's a little sweet, why I say it's bittersweet is because then you see that there are other people from other parts of the world may not understand what you're saying in a conversation, but they understand how you feel, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that bit of unity, that just tiny bit of uh, understanding and connection really um, helps with coping it, you know? And I think from my own experience that I've seen and um, for as a New Yorker, it's genuinely, I think, um, genuinely, I think that it's, it's good to take in all these stories to under, like, because in the, in the, um, in the anthology, you see that there are some nuanced stories, maybe you not understanding what, how clear it is. Some of them are directly this, some of them are directly positive and negative. And I think it's important to absorb all of that because this is a this what we're living in, um, and this is what I've come to understand as a New Yorker. What we're living in is not a, a time that is normal. This has never happened before in this period of time with technology that we have, with the understanding of history that we have. Uh, this has never happened before, and I think it's important to see this pandemic and see this uh, as you know, as I've seen in as a passenger. It's important to see this event in history from multiple perspectives because you get a, a better fundamental connection and understanding of it. Oh, well said. I, I completely agree, Sophia. Um, let me share your story, actually, um, so everyone can, can kind of take a look. Yours was one of them. The, um, well, all of the stories were very personal, but I feel like yours was one of the, uh, one of the very introspective stories. I felt it, it sort of started off as uh, kind of was structured like a monologue, almost yeah. metered as such. Uh, but it felt very internal too, like going through a lot of your feelings. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I, 
I honestly, like as someone who was working on the book, mm -hmm. uh, what struck me about this piece was uh, how similarly I felt towards this character who was going through an experience that was very specific to her, but also like, you know, the, the overall tone of what she was going through was something I could relate to as well. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the funny thing about this uh, comic is that it is an, initially a monologue. It was meant to be an assignment for my class. And the oh. assignment was a one page monologue. And you could be whatever you want, whatever the monologue was, um, would be, uh, you could do of whatever you want. And I think my own personal experience, um, the internal experience that I was going through during the quarantine was, is that, is that I've seen so many heartbreaking stories of um, friends of mine who were suffering with being inside because they're extroverted or others that are failing their grades and, and during my experience, I felt like I should have felt feelings. I should have felt sad. I should have felt anxious, um, but I didn't. And that made me feel very mechanical because the way that I was going through the entire uh, beginning of it was doing my homework, doing projects, uh, distracting myself in that way. And it made me feel productive. So in the beginning, when she was talking about, well, she being me, when she was talking about how uh, how workaholic it is, that things work must be done, um, and it sounds mechanical and human, that was my, um, that was how I felt it was, like coming across, because fundamentally, um, this sort like I felt like you know uh not taking a break to listen to other stories or whatever is wrong you know but what I've mm -hmm. come to realize especially in this comic is that I was feeling feelings that the feelings that I did feel maybe could not be put into words but they were definitely there and the way that I was coping with was through work <laughs> and um even though I do self-identify as a workaholic uh, which which makes it even which makes the the piece even more personal um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and I think that's where that was standing because that's was my perspective and I tend to consider myself a very in, uh, introspective person so the fact that you it came across as introspective was great <laughs> to hear. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Sophia. Well, I, I actually, you know, um, I, I have a couple of questions for the group as a whole, and any of you feel free to chime in. Um, all of you here on this call right now, this is your first exposure to, to the Art Students League, uh, as far as I know. Um, and, you know, you might know this already, but we have been a fine art school since 1875. And, you know, we're all so pleased to have reached this new group of artists. How did you find out about this open call? And how were we so lucky to have you on this book? I can take this one. Um, <laughs> so, like I mentioned before, that this comic was originally supposed to be an assignment in my class. Mm -hmm. um, in my school at art and design high school um originally it was that and the funny thing the funny thing is is that my um cartooning teacher would always put out these opportunities he would always put out an opportunity for an internship for a um competition mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. regardless of that um but last year was kind of different because um we were do again the one page assignment was required it was a part of an assignment but he gave us the option um for extra credit um if you could submit it into the this quarantine life because a lot of the comics were about quarantine and that's what I ended up doing I ended up uh so I heard it through my teacher I ended up submitting it uh not thinking that I was gonna get in um but me and a bunch of other the kids of the same class got in and we were all super excited to hear that amazing amazing um would someone you like to answer uh if you don't mind sophia that's fantastic at, at, mm -hmm. your, at your young age that's uh it takes guts yeah it was uh, I, we, I had um a, 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 a good friend of mine and a painter and a, a wonderful painter called emma sellers uh, she was studying in italy and she saw the instagram post pass it on to my fiance who's a comic artist uh, from the philippines and then she oh, wow. <laughs> passed it on, pass it on to me. And so, yeah, it was through Instagram, but it, it traveled via Italy 
Philippines, New Zealand. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, now that the book is available for download, um, and maybe Susanna, you can tell us a little bit, like, what does it mean to you to be published and part of this anthology, which is now available in, in all over the world, in over 50 countries? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. I still can't believe it because when I was sending that page to you, I really didn't think that it will, it will get published because it's just, I'm just from a small country which no one really knows. And I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna try it because I like these challenges and it, it, it works and it's, it's there. It's really amazing. I wanted to really thank you because this is such a great opportunity. Well, let me share your story for a second so people can see. Um, this is um, Zuzana's story. Um, and I think it's, it, it's one of the, the best designed stories in the book. Um, Zuzana, can you tell me a little bit about, um, I guess, maybe what inspired this specific sequence of images for you? Yeah, I think it was, it was really strange because uh, this uh, town, which you can see in my page, uh, is actually our capital city. And I think that every capital city is uh, like center of tourism. And it's, it was really weird to see uh, th this big city, which is full of life, so empty. And I have never really seen this before. And I really want to sometime, some, somehow incorporate it into it. And I also heard a lot of news about that the nature is finding its way and it's, uh, it's some, somehow helpful for it. If I say it that way, it's, it's strange to say that pandemic was good for something, but yeah, I think I, st I try to like combine the power of nature and this big city. And yeah, I think this, this was the main team. Oh, that's beautiful. And, you know, on, on the topic of, um, of uh, positive messages, I guess for all of you, um, now that your stories are out there, what positive message would you like people to take away from your work? I would like to speak about it. And I think that in this time of isolation we were going through, that was the time I was more aware about others because I wasn't seeing them. So I think what I, I got the most from this experience was to start to really think about other people. And that is what is my comic about too, because you know, we li I live in a, in a very poor country. We have people that really don't have too much. And I saw the desperation of these people trying to work all the time. We knew that we needed to quarantine, but people just can't. And people was dealing with that a lot. And I was very fortunate to be in working from home, but you know, being here at home alone, isolated, just made me think about others a lot. And I would like to, to think that more people can share that, that feeling too, that feeling about uh, thinking about other people and trying to do something trying to do something to not to just help in this occasion, but trying to, I don't know, something like work to, to create a, a better synergy of, of development for everyone. I, I think that I have like raw thoughts about it, but my main sensation is that it's like reflecting about other people that are not in your same privileged situation. Is that what the last panel of your comics about? I was curious why you ended on this note. Uh, well, that, that's basically me just feeling that every day was the same and kind of having this, this privileged sensation that wasn't comfortable and at the same time was comfortable. I think that it was resumed to that. Mm, I, I actually, on, on that note, like everything being the same, I want to share for a second uh, Martin's comic, um, just so people can see. Um, I think this was one of the most um, humorous. You really don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to show it off because like it's, you know. 
There we go. Um, is this this one? You know, I'm oh, sorry by the way. It's a it's a TIFF file. Um, uh, yeah, um, the CMYK translation. But um, it this is a you know this is uh, one of the more animated styles. Um, it almost could. It feels to me like you could you could do some sectioning in between each panel, and make it this kind of r really strange time lapse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think, I don't know if you're aware, but New Zealand kind of, we just hit it hard. It came, it went away. We had a second lockdown. It came and went away. Like last night, we went into a cafe full of people, really close. And I know that that's not the situation for everyone. So we're incredibly lucky, um, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, essentially, I worked through the lockdown. It, 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 time just passed. So I'm the poor guy on the left um, growing his hair. <laughs> His t-shirt's getting all gross. Um, we had teddy bears in the window so the kids could point at things when they walk with their families. I kind of wanted to take all the text away and just let you kind of slow down and take your time, look through everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's very striking. Um, oh, it really stands out. I think, I think everyone here um, presented such unique perspectives, you know, and I think that's, that's the huge value of an anthology book, um, whether it's in prose or poetry or comics, you know, you get um, the full spectrum of perspectives. Um, so it's such a huge honor to like have all of you on this book. And thank you so much for contributing and being here tonight. Um, we actually still have, um, we have time to start a, uh, a short Q and A and um, we'll be taking some questions from Facebook on Facebook Live to all the people watching out there right now. Um, and, and give me a moment while we, um, while we uh, get questions. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so from, this is from iGeneration Youth. Um, and anyone feel free to answer. Uh, can you point to any way working during the pandemic affected your art? Anyone want to answer that? Totally. I do more art right now. More art. <laughs> um, so, so have your habits changed since, um, since, since the, I, I would say, I think for me personally, when the pandemic started, I think for the first month or so, I could not do any art. Um, I was just like dealing with the sudden change to life. But over time, I was able to adjust a little and start to create kind of a routine wherein I can focus on, um, on, on my personal work and being able to work from home, even though, you know, my usual, um, like the, the days that I'm used to um, has, has to effectively change. Um, Ray, do you guys feel like you were able to do more or less? Um, I mean, apart from Willie, Michelle? Um, for me, I feel like I've been doing more. So I do, um, I did went to art school and then with the pandemic, I felt more inspired and I guess I'm trying to figure out the word, but like, I felt like it was like my responsibility to use like, you know, me being at home to make a difference with art. I got, I pushed, I got pushed more towards editorial art. So I've been making art just for like, you know, for the last like year, just to help out with like, you know, the Black Lives Movement and also with like, you know, with, mm -hmm. with funding for like, you know, for, just with funding with you know, food and things like that. And it's, it's the year's not over yet. So I'm just gonna keep on like helping with galleries, like raising funds. And that's something that just makes me feel better. And also I think girls artists, like I've been like typically like, I think quiet with my work, like quiet with my work. So like when I do editorial work, I'm like loud. I'm very like to the point. Mm -hmm. it's just so nice to see people like people reach out to me saying that oh thank you for your art thank you for like you know helping with these charities and just like you know having you like a being a voice of reason and just you know saying things that people are just afraid to say so uh, actually michelle uh, oh yeah no. <laughs> oh yeah sorry um so michelle we actually have another question for you from rudy from new york city um, he was asking, what are you feeling? What are you feeling right now specifically um, about the sentiment, um, the, the anti-Asian sentiment now in November, now that all this time has passed? So for this, like, 
you know, of course, like it, it still exists, but right now, like, you know, for you know, for our country of the United States as a whole, like we're focusing more on like other, you know, racial groups, you know, because like, like because you know, we understand like there is colorism that exists in this in this country, you know. Like, and so we, it does exist for Asians, but I want to just be more focused on other you know, racial groups that need attention. It's mm-hmm. just because we are a community. So it does exist, but it's still like the second priority because there's other things that we need to take care of, you know. So yeah. Um, from Mauricio, um, the question is, when will the book be in print, if at all? <laughs> um, I'm sure we're all wondering that. Uh, actually, I can answer that question because um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of behind the scenes. Um, we are working on, a, on doing a print edition sometime in 2021. Um, you know, we, <laughs> I, I, Steve, Steve Walker was talking a while ago about that experience of like having the book in your hand and smelling it and, you know, nothing beating that feeling of um, knowing your work is published and in print. So we are working towards that. 2021, we just need to interface with printers and make sure that the coronavirus restrictions have eased up enough that we can actually approach that possibility. Um, We have another question um, from Travis from Facebook. Have any of the artists rethought or reconsidered their stories more recently as the pandemic continues on and affects our lives in different ways since the early onset when the stories were submitted? Hmm, Interesting question. Absolutely. Complete privilege. Like, (laughs) we have not gone through some hardship, man. Like, I wish, yeah. Come, come to New Zealand, everyone. It's sunny. We got lunch. It's good. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think, honestly, I think the story that I that I did in my comic, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't redo it. You know what I mean? Like redo it now. Um, I, I gen, I honestly like the way that I was thinking in that time is like. Um, it was kind of where our point where I was kind of lost. Now I understand why I thought of certain things, why I behaved a certain way, why I've seen other stories, why, you know, the way that I've understood those stories. I think I would do something different, but I would not overdo, like redo it for any point in the world because like the way that I did it at the time was the way I was thinking, you know, and people are going to, and that's, you know, that's the best part about being in this, in this anthology is that, once it's in your hands, it's going to be in other people's hands. It's going to be in uh, your family members, friends, whatever. And then their family members, friends, whatever. It becomes a part of history, you know? So mm-hmm. people are going to look, you're going to look past it and you're going to see that like in 2040, they, they're, there's going to be kids that are going to be like, oh my God, this is what people thought in 2020. You know, this is the top, this is the thought process. This is what happened in March, May, April or early on, right? Earlier than that. So yeah, that, that's 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 why we we actually had the we we had a timestamp at the start of the book right. to kind of tell people like okay, so it was submit we we started closed down in March, we submitted in May, we we put the open call out in May. This is the book um, to kind of give them a sense of this is a time capsule of people's feelings, right. and you know history is full of examples of um, art that maybe it's not as sensitive today or, or you know, um, maybe could be rethought. But I think that's also the great thing about art because it reflects the time in which it was created. Um, and that's really important, um, you know, especially for a project like this, wherein there's so much going on, it's easy to, to lose sight of the individual um, in this pandemic. Now you have a hundred page book that's got uh, you know, a hundred <laughs> different perspectives, individual perspectives <laughs> that you can experience um, through art. Um, sorry, I'm gonna add. I'm gonna move on and add more questions because we're getting some yeah, more questions yeah, from yeah. Facebook. Uh, from Marcus in North Dakota, um, his question is: Zuzana, where can we see more of your work? Oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> For first, thank you that you want to see more of my work. Well, I I am on Instagram. I think that Andrew will will show it at the end, maybe that our our Instagram account. Um, maybe that we can talk about it now. Actually, like tell people where what what what, the, what our individual Instagram accounts are, so they can see more of our work. 
Um, I believe Zuzanas is at um, Zazaji underscore pictures. So that's yeah. two Zs at the yeah. start. Um, and guys, you should check it out because like she <laughs> is clearly a, a hardworking um, <laughs> cartoonist. Like her, her feed is full of, um, of artwork um, that, that just keeps going and going. Oh, okay. um, uh, if you guys are interested in Martin Paris's work, it's um, at Martin Paris with one S at the end um, on Instagram. Yep, that's right. Uh, you also see the, uh, the lunch. I get catered lunch here. Uh, we're working on Power Rangers right now, the television show. So you get a lot of food, a lot of food pics. <laughs> <laughs> um, for Willie um, from Ecuador, uh, his Instagram is at Willie. Thir- oh, there we go. <laughs> it's, it's at Willie131988. It's a little complicated, but it'll be worth it if you find it, guys. Because like, you know, um, <laughs> Willie's art is... <laughs> It's, it's top notch. You've seen it in his page. Um, for uh, Michelle, it's Sunflower Hughes, at Sunflower Hughes, one word, um, all lowercase. And for, um, for Sophia, it's at The Art of Sob. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy to remember. Very easy to remember. <laughs> S-O-B. <laughs> Um, and I think we have uh, we have one more question, Ronald from Facebook. Um, for those artists new to the league, has this experience inspired them to participate in future league projects? Absolutely. <laughs> the the league has been so promised and hyped up already um, by my teacher, by my peers. It's already been kind of hyped up to where it's like, oh, okay, that sounds like a good idea if I ever wanted to participate. And then this happened and I'm like, no doubt, you know, <laughs> it's going to happen eventually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If uh, with, Without this experience, I wouldn't have been able to see Jamal wear a t-shirt that says handsome. And that's just made my day. <laughs> I wouldn't have met Jamal at all. Like, yeah, it's still blowing. Yeah, I'm, I'm super. Like, oh my god, I am fanboying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jamal, Jamal, I love your art. Oh my god. <laughs> Uh, we're almost done on time, by the way. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, Maria from Facebook. Her, her question is, she says, I love that the comics also touch social realities such as poverty and corruption and racism. I think it's necessary. Um, that's more of a, a comment than, 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 than a question, but would anyone want to respond to that? Well, it's unavoidable. We are always thinking about that. Uh, you know, the world is, has a lot of trouble, so I think comics reflect that all the time and that's the kind of comic i like to read all all the time so i I hope that that thing keeps going Mm -hmm. i super agree i think um you know it's as artists our role is really to to process the world around us and and to to translate that into our art so that other people can see that people in the future, people from far away can see that and relate to it and be informed. Um, maybe not by the, the very specifics of the situation, the way the news or, you know, like a news report would do it, uh, but by the emotions, um, you know, that we're all feeling. I think that that is the most humanistic element of art that, you know, um, I, I really appreciate when I read all of your work and the, in, in the anthology. Um, okay. We're almost done. One, one more question. Mauricio from Facebook. What medium did most use to create their individual pieces? Strictly digital? So can we go around the table? Maybe tell us what you used or what medium you used to create your story? Martin? Oh, sure. So uh, Adobe Illustrator. I like the, 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 yeah, the, the precise line work and that kind of stuff. So I went for that. Wow. <laughs> um, Willie? Oh, well, I was in Photoshop. I was drawing with this and falling in love with it. Photoshop, Photoshop. Nice. That's dope. Yeah. <laughs> Michelle? Um, I use Procreate for this. <laughs> awesome. I use Procreate too, actually, for my story. Um, and then in the end, I composited it on Photoshop. But, you know. Yeah, same. It's just so convenient just to have on the iPad and then the Apple pod- Products doesn't support like 
you know, like, what's it called? Photoshop for some reason. I don't know why. It doesn't support. Well, it's got a Photoshop version on it now, but it's not the best. So. Yeah, I, I used that. I was like, I hate this. Let me switch desktop for that. <laughs> um, what about you, Sophia? What, what did you use for your work? Uh, classic sixth generation uh, iPad Procreate. You can't go wrong with that, man. Like, I'm, I'm in love with Procreate. Procreate. <laughs> Two years loyal. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Susanna, what about you? <laughs> well, I always like sketching just with a paper and pencil, and then I exported it and I use Paint Tool Sai. Oh, Paint Tool Sai. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a lot of comics artists are, are actually, use, especially in Japan, I think that that program in particular is tuned towards comics art specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I was really glad that I didn't have to write a text here because I have an older older version and there is no no such a thing as a text uh, text uh, opportunity. So I was really glad that my comics was without. It. Yeah. So uh, so Mauricio, um, I hope that answers your question. Basically, everyone um, on this panel did it digitally. Um, but I will tell you, if you pick up the book, um, which you really should check it out because um, it's free and it's downloadable online right now, um, you will see stories that are done also in traditional media. There are painted stories. There are stories done in colored pencil um, or ink traditionally. So, um, yeah, but it look, looks like a lot of people here um, are digital artists. <laughs> um, Okay, I think that is all the time we have right now. We're almost um, to 7 p.m. Um, you know, first and foremost, I really want to thank all of you guys for being here tonight, um, for being a part of this um, event, and also for submitting your stories and, and partaking of this um, incredible anthology that I'm so proud of. Um, thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And for um, yeah, and for uh, uh for those of you watching right now, uh, make sure to download the book. You can get it right now at the Art Students League's website. Um, you can also find it on Apple Books. Just search for it there. Um, and um, coming next year, we will have it out on more platforms such as Comixology. We're just waiting for um. Uh, to process stuff so that it can come out on that platform because it takes a little longer. But yeah, download it now. Check it out because, um, you know, you don't want to miss this experience. Um, for more information about the Art Students League of New York, um, please do visit our website, the Art Students League um, of, uh, wait, the Art Students League of New York dot org. And um, follow us on Instagram at ASLNYC because uh, that's where we initially put out the call. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are probably going to um, work on a new anthology in 2021. So um, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't forget, guys, the Art Students League that, dot org. And, um, yeah, for all of you at home, thank you so much for watching. Um, thank you so much for being here uh, and stay happy and stay healthy. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye.